in our series, and this is the last uh, this is the last sermon of the series, Core Values, and we've been talking about them over the course of the past month, and um, it's just been an incredible uh, thing for us to be able to sit back and look at what God is doing in our hearts as a ministry collectively and even individually. We'll kind of lay out what the core values are. Again, we'll do a brief overview of, of each core value that we've been through so far. And, I, and, and just to kind of recap, um, when we came here seven years ago, over seven years ago, because we're going into our eighth year, this December will be eight years, um, God gave us some, some, some specific things that we were to be as a church and what we were to talk about and how we were to conduct ourselves. He gave us a passage of Scripture that we felt was like the core of who we wanted to become as a church, an Acts 2.42 church, a church devoted to the Word, to fellowship, to worship, and to prayer. And we try to model that. And, and over the course of the seven years, God never really gave me as a pastor a clear vision statement or mission statement. And, I, and, and, I'm, and going into any kind of organization, always they tell you you need to have a vision statement and a mission statement. Well, I believe what God has been doing these past several years, these past seven years, is developing us into who he's called us to be. Me as a pastor, has, I have no desire, I've had no desire to come in here and, and, and do this for a little while and then move on to something else. I feel like God has called me to pastor this local congregation for as long as he says without any desire or thought of moving to another place. We've never had that thought of moving to another place. We've had some thoughts at times where we've wrestled with where we, where we, where we should we be doing this, you know, struggled in those areas, and I've shared that with you before, but never should we pastor this local congregation and go somewhere else. And so over that time, God has really developed these values in us, and we can see them have, have played out over the years. And so now we are coming to a place. Like at the beginning of this year, the, God gave us the word for the year, and that was transformation. And so this, as we got into that word and we're trying to lay out what that means to be transformed, to be made into the likeness of Christ, to become more like Jesus, uh, part of that is, is the, what, who we are as a people, you know, the values speak of who we are and, and the, the very depths of who we are. And so, so in this process of transformation, God has been telling us some things about getting yourself, getting things in order, get yourself, get some structure in order, get things ready not knowing at the time when he gave us the word and not knowing that he was going to transform this body and he was calling us to prepare ourselves for transformation and begin to structure ourselves for growth, that he was already working things out. And we've talked a little bit about that, about the merger with KOE and Power and Praise. Uh, that's official. And, and, and then also God is bringing people into the body and the body's growing. And now we're, we know now why God never does anything haphazardly or spontaneous. God has a plan in everything that he does. Amen. He saw this way back in eternity past somewhere. I don't know when it was, but I can't pinpoint it. But he knew that we would be here together on this Sunday doing this, going through this. And so that's who he is. That's beyond my pay grade and my understanding. I can't get my mind completely around that. But if you're here in the body at, at this time, at this season, man, you're in a good place. You really are. I'm going to tell you that right now. I don't, I'm, can I just brag a little bit about the Power and Praise Worship Center? Man, the presence of the Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. The Word of God is preached in this place. I truly believe God is honored in this place. Do we do everything perfectly? No, by no means. But, man, are we striving to be more like Jesus? Yes, that's our aim. That's our goal. So we're going to go after the Lord and these things. And so that's one of the reasons why we're laying out the core values now is because this is who God says that he, this is who we believe identifies who we are as a people. And, I, and, I, and I'm just going and, and to bring things full circle, I just want to kind of go back and just recap a couple of things just real quick. Core values are central beliefs, standards, or, and ideals that drive attitude, decision, and behavior of individual and or, or an organization. The values of a group or an individual is seen more often than heard. The values are seen more often than heard. The values that we are talking about today, we want to exemplify those values in our actions, right? The, the actions speak louder than words. We want people to see more than hear what we say, because what, then what we say will be more heard because of what people see. When people can see something that's authentic and genuine, they're more apt to listen to that person or individual. And so when we can live out these God values, and that's what they are, they're God values, 
people are more drawn to the Lord. The Bible says that, that uh, uh, um, the, the passage is in my mind, and I'm having a hard time recalling it correctly. Uh, let men see our good works that they may glorify the Father. Amen. When people see in us these values lived out, it brings God honor and glory. Why? Because these values were personified by Jesus. Now, these values aren't exhausted by any means. There's only a handful that we've picked, and those may grow over time. We may add to those, but these are some that we felt were important for us as a body. Our core values are honor, humility, authenticity, excellence, and generosity. We started the series talking about authenticity and what does it mean to be authentic. And to be authentic means to be in process and that we're in a process continually. God is making us into something that's real and genuine, amen? The genuineness of our faith is being produced through the things that we go through in life. And so the process of life helps us to become more and more authentic and reveals the authenticness of our faith. And, and, and then humility, we talked about humility, and this is what, we, it honors the Lord. God resists the proud, Brother Tony, but he gives grace to the humble. He exalts those that, that, those that humble themselves. He will exalt them in due season, amen. And to those that walk in humility, he gives greater grace, amen. And Jesus exemplified humility to us, and we need to walk in humility towards each other and show humility towards each other. Uh, we talked about honor and how we are to honor one another and outdo each other in honor. It's important that we outdo each other, do our best to honor others because in doing so, we honor God. Everything that we do goes back to God. It's about God. It's for God. It's back to God, right? And so everything we do, when we honor our parents, it's as unto the Lord. When we, uh, when we uh, love our wives as Christ, it's unto the Lord. When we submit our uh, wives submit to their husbands, it's unto the Lord. The reality is whatever we do, it ought to be always bringing honor to God. That's, that's what our lives ought to be about. We talked about excellence and, and the importance of excellence and how we do things with excellence because whatever God touches is good, amen, very good, and he does things with excellence, and he's put in us that same spirit, and so we want to walk in that same spirit of excellence. Everything we do, we do wholeheartedly is under the Lord. We do it to the best of our ability, and today we're going to talk about this big word that can make some people, maybe make some people nervous, but we're going to talk about this word generosity. What does it mean? To be generous. And so there's a lot of scripture. The Bible has a whole lot to say about generosity and what it means to be generous. And it's a lot to do with giving, and a lot of it's to do with giving of material things, but it's more than just that. Generosity in its very essence is based on love. You can't, someone said, you can, you can give without loving, but you can't love and not give. If you really love, you're going to be a giver, amen. And so the reality of generosity is based on love. Yesterday, man, we had, this, we had uh, the opportunity, and you'll get to meet all those people in just a couple of weeks uh, face-to-face. More, more, you'll get to know them more, uh, more closely in the weeks to come, but we had the opportunity to take uh, many of our brothers and sisters through our, our membership class, which if you haven't been through the membership class, I really want to encourage you to do that. Do that soon. Sign up for that. And, uh, and it was said when we talked about unity of the body, that unity, has fa- its foundation is love. The gifts of the Spirit has to hinge and be built on love. Everything at the end is on love. Faith, hope, and love. These three remain, but the greatest of these is love. And so whatever we do, living out these values comes from a place of sincere love for God and love for others. And generosity has to be rooted and grounded in that. You can look generous on the outside, but God knows, and he judges the heart. True story about an example in the Bible. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, at the end of chapter 4, the church had come together, and God was moving miraculously, adding to the church daily. And, man, thousands were being saved, and signs and wonders were happening, and people were in amazement about God and about what he was doing through the hands of these men, these apostles. And God was just doing incredible things, and people's hearts were stirred to begin to share with what they had, and the rich were selling off property, and people were giving up things of their possessions and making sure that everybody's needs were taken care of, and and there was sincere, authentic love for one another, and then just like anything that ever happens in in, in, in the world, or let me just say that what often happens in the church, when God is doing a thing and God is working and moving the church, you can be sure that the devil gonna try to stick his head up somewhere to be a disruptor, amen, 
And he's going to try to get in there and be deceptive and deceive. But let me tell you something. You can lie to, to uh, uh, some people some of the time, but you can't lie to God any of the time. I mean, God knows and judges the motives and intentions of the heart. And so there was this two, these two individuals, Ananias and Sapphira. And they had, was a part of this group, this part of the church. And, and so they had taken their possession, some land that was theirs, and they had sold it. And they went to before the apostles, and they, had, and, and they were looking at what everybody else was doing. They wanted, to be, they wanted to look the part, going back to being authentic, right? They wanted to look the part, but in their heart of hearts, they weren't living the part. Amen. And so, so anyway, they come, and they bring their, 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 their purchase, their, the sale of the proceeds from the sale of their of their offering and their, their gift, and they bring it to the church and said, this is what we have to give to you. And right away, the Holy Spirit speaks to Peter and says, why would you lie? Do this wicked thing and lie to the Holy Ghost. And immediately, Ananias was struck dead right before the apostle Peter. And not long after that, his wife comes in. She wasn't there when it happened, and he, he asked her, what did you get for the property? How much did you? And she had the same story as her husband. She had not known that her husband passed away. And immediately he said, the same people that carried your husband out are waiting at the door to carry your body out. Boom, dead right there on the spot. Now, just that sounds like a harsh story to talk about because these people gave money. To, they gave probably a large sum of money to the church. It's not just about money. It's about the heart, right? It's never been about heart. When, when God wants it, desires for the, uh, the body of Christ to be generous in their giving and to, and to, and to practice, I believe, a spiritual discipline of giving and tithe and offering, it's never about our money. It's about our heart. It's ultimately about faith. Do we trust God enough to take care of us that we can give up of what we have? That's why in another place when Jesus was uh, in the temple watching, just observing, standing back and watching, he was watching all the people coming in, dropping their offerings in the offering box, and he noticed a little widow woman, poor, impoverished woman, who comes in and only has two denarii, two like two pennies, and she drops those in that box. And he tells his disciples, come here, I want to show you something. You see all these, these affluent people and people of, that ha are wealthy, they're coming in and they're giving money to the, to, the, to the house of God, to the temple, according to the law, and they're giving in the, out of their abundance. They're giving large amounts. But this little lady who only had a small, just a few pennies, she gives that. He, he says in God's estimation, because this is the way God determines things, right? He says she gave more than all those others because they gave out of their abundance. She gave out of her poverty. She gave of all that she had. When, it come, when we stand before God, it, whether it be our gifts, our abilities, our treasures, it doesn't matter. God's not going to evaluate us on what we've attained. He's going to evaluate us. Were we faithful with what we had? Amen. That's what God's going to evaluate us on. Were we faithful with what we had? Little is much when God is in it. Amen. And so Anna and Sapphira, they... they God judges them as why he was establishing the church. He was making sure that people knew that this thing was real. And, and, and they told him, and they, he said to them, you could have given whatever you want to. It wasn't what you gave that God was concerned about. The reality was you were trying to, to say, I'm this when you weren't that. You tried to lie to God, and you tried to lie to, the, to man to put yourself in a position that was favorable before others. And so that's the, re, that's the key here, right? That's the, that's the key here. And so when we come back to generosity, it's about the heart. It's ultimately about the heart. Amen. Uh, praise God. Let me just kind of read a couple of things here for you. Watch this. This is the, the, the Google search definition of generosity, and then I'm going to give you a biblical de definition. To be generous is to be open-handed, kind, charitable, and self-sacrificing. That's a good definition because what I found, and we'll probably see in some of the scriptures this morning, is that when you, you, you see oftentimes in the, in the, in the Bible that generosity is attached to kindness and compassion. It's attached to it. It's not just being generous. It's not just about giving, but it's about giving from a place of a heart of sincerity from kindness and compassion. The Bible has a lot to say about this. Uh, generosity. Here's the, here's the Bible definition of generosity. A free to the free and liberal bestowal of wealth, possessions, or food upon others. The generosity of God is shown in his free bestowal of grace upon 
undeserving sinners. God is generous. Everything that we talk about and everything that we try to do and we try to model as people of God ought to be the way God did it, right? We don't need to come up with some new way to impress God. Let's just do it God's way. God set the standard for us, so let's just go by God's standard. Let's don't try to outdo God. Let's just do it God's way. And if we do it God's way, we'll do it right every time, and we'll be blessed in it. Amen. And so God gives us the example of what generosity looks like. And, man, I'm telling you, it's beyond our understanding to really grab a hold of this, but let's just take his as a model, and we try to press towards, strive towards being like Jesus, being willing to give of everything that we have because that's what God did. God didn't withhold anything from us in giving us his son. I'm going to show you this. Look, go to with me to Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 7 through 9, I think it is. I think I'm in the right verse. God is generous. Look at your neighbor and say, God is generous. Look back at him and say, I know. Look at you. <laughs> oh, anyway, all right. Let me keep on going. <laughs> Look at it. In him we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he sent forth in Christ. God lavished from the riches of his grace, he lavished on us. That means to shower, to pour out in abundance. God lavished on us abundant grace. When Peter, when Jesus was having a conversation with Nicodemus, the religious leader, and he comes to Jesus at night because he's afraid of what others might think of him having a conversation with Jesus, he began to have this talk, and he says, we know you're from God because no man can do the things that you do but God, and so we know that you come from God, and so they start having this conversation, and he tells Nicodemus, he says, Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. And he said, well, how can you be born again? How can a man enter into his mother's womb in old age? He says, what's born of the spirit is spirit, and what's born of the flesh is flesh. I'm not talking about the natural thing. I'm talking about the spirit thing. That's why one chapter over when he's talking about worship, he says, if you're going to worship God, it's in spirit and truth. It's not just, the, just in our mind and our intellect, but it's in faith that we worship God. Amen. And so he tells him, he says, you've got to worship him. you got to uh, be born of the spirit. And then he says this to him. He says, God so loved the world. This is how you're born again. You need to understand that God gave the opportunity and God loved the world so much. That he gave his only begotten son. He lavished that love on us by giving the best that he had. That's why in the Old Testament when the Lord chastised his people and their hearts and the motive of their hearts, they were bringing offerings to God, but they were bringing lame and crippled offerings. They were bringing half-hearted offerings. He even says in one place, you worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Generosity is an issue of the heart. It's because generosity is, is, we're going to see in just a minute, it's, it's ultimately about worship to God. Living all of these things out is about ultimately living a life of worship to God. Not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind, which is our reasonable act of worship. And so that's what it's all about. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Let's keep on going. Believers should be generous in their dealings with others following the example that God himself has given. God gives us the example. That's why, look, that's why we can never say anything about God, that God, God will never ask of us anything, Brother Jeffrey, that he's not willing to give us the example or, or a, a point of, uh, a point of something that we can point to that we can, that we can see, right? So, for instance, one of, the, one of the greatest texts in the Bible is a foreshadowing of what Jesus is going to do, what God is going to do through Jesus. Abraham. Abraham has this call from God to come out from his father's house. And God calls Abraham, and over the course of Abraham's life, he makes promises to Abraham. And Abraham walks in faith, and sometimes he misses it, and sometimes he gets it right. And finally, God comes good on his promise to Abraham. And Abraham has a son named Isaac. And now Abraham is, uh, God tells Abraham after years of having Isaac, Isaac is, a, some believe, is a grown man. At this time, he's not a little kid. He says, take your son and offer him on Mount Moriah, the place I tell you, which historically, if you want to know the truth, the place where Abraham offers up Isaac is the same place Jesus gives his life. There's where Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem will be built, where the temple mount is. Same place, amen. And so God's foreshadowing these things, and he's showing them to Abraham. And so he tells Abraham, go offer your son Isaac. 
And Isaac, and he takes Isaac up the mountain. And as he's taking Isaac up the mountain, Isaac says to him, says, where is the sacrifice? And the Lord, and Abraham says, by the Spirit, he says, don't worry, God will provide a lamb. God was giving, and so God tells Abraham to go up. Now, we say, well, how, you said God would never ask us to do something that he wouldn't do himself. Watch this. You got to see this. God is speaking about things to come, but he's testing Abraham's heart in faith. And so Abraham says, God will provide a lamb Don't worry, son. And so they get up on the mountain. Abraham prepares the offering. Isaac freely lays down his life because he's at an age where he could probably overtake his father, who's an old man, but he willingly lets his father bind his hands and lay him on the altar and draw the knife back. And before he can sacrifice, plunge the knife into the chest of Isaac. God says, don't touch the lad. Leave him alone. And in that moment, God begins to approve Abraham's faithfulness to him. And then Abraham looks over and he sees a ram in the thicket. Now, this is, we got to see this. Watch this. Now, the ram in the thicket was going to be the sacrifice to take the place of Isaac. But that's not what Abraham said. Abraham didn't say God will provide a ram. Abraham, Abraham said God will provide a lamb. Amen. And so God gives him a ram for a, for a, a temporary substitution for what would needed to, because the offering still needed to be made there on the mountain. But later on, fast forward 1,400 years later, here comes Jesus walking through the, 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 the Jord, by the Jordan River, and he's walking through the, around the Sea of Galilee, and, and, and John the Baptist beholds Jesus coming, and he says, hey, everybody, stop, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God is generous in all that he does, amen. And God will never ask us to do something that he won't give us an example or a way that he would do himself. Does that make sense? What I, did I articulate that right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so Jesus is saying, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son even before he died on the cross. He said, I'm here because my father is generous. He's given everything. Come on, somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. So what should motivate our motivations for generosity is God's example. 2 Corinthians 8, 7 through 9. I want to read this. But as you excel in everything in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in your love, and in our love for you, as, let me say, but as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you also excel in this act of grace also. What is the act of grace? He's talking about generosity. Generosity is an act of grace. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnest, earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. See what I said? There? See how that's connected? Generosity is connected to authentic, genuine love. This is a good word, man. Thank you, Holy Ghost. For you know, that, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, th- that though he was rich yet for our sake became poor so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. What motivates us? God's example ought to motivate us. Christ, who was rich, became poor so that we who were poor might become rich. And you say, well, how am I rich? Because I'm an heir and a joint heir with Christ Jesus. And I'm going to receive my, my, I'm going to receive my inheritance on the appointed day. See, you can't just get your inheritance. When you are written into the will, there comes an appointed day for you to receive the inheritance. Our appointed day is not based upon just a death. Our appointed day is based upon a life. He gave his life it back up and rose from the dead, uh, promising us an inheritance at his return. Amen. And so we're looking for his return, and he's going to give us everything that he promised. And I said, I'm rich today because he became poor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. 1 John 3, 16. 1 John 3, 16 through 18. Amen. 1 John John 3, 16 talks about for God so loved the world. 1 John 3, 16, look what it says. Same writer, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for others. Generosity really is about that, right? It's about the giving up of ourselves sacrificially for the benefit of others. That's really what generosity is. It's not just about pulling out your pocketbook, pulling out your checkbook or your wallet and just giving money. It's more than that. It's the willingness to share from the from 
the core of who you are with others that are in need. That's really what generosity is. He says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. It's easy to talk about what we should do and could do. It's another thing to actually do it. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. Um, let me do one more about God's example. I'm going to try to hurry, all right? But let me do one more. Ephesians 4, 32 through 5 and 2. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted. So, now, so now remember, the definition of generosity is kind, compassionate, open-handed. He says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Christ gave he was generous in giving his life to us. Therefore, let us imitate the Father in doing likewise. Amen. Praise God. Uh, there are demonstrations through the Bible of generosity. So I'm just going to kind of hit these real quick. And, and, and there's the, one example or one uh, demonstration of generosity is in material giving. We talked about that passage in Acts where uh, Ananias and Sapphira are judged in chapter 5. But before that, we see uh, Barnabas, who was a son of encouragement. He was one who sold some property and gave it to the church to meet the needs of others. You can give, you can be generous in material giving, and the giving of material things. You can be generous in the support of God's work. We see this in the Old Testament. They were told to bring the offerings, and it was free will. It was free will. They weren't commanded to do it, that God would be upset. He said, but it, for them to come and bring a free will offering that they might prepare a place tabernacle for the, the presence of God to dwell in. And so the people began to bring earrings and gold, all the things that they had taken from Egypt out of bondage, they began to bring it to Moses and to Aaron to put into the treasury of the house of God and to make the things that were needed for worship. We can worship God. Generosity is an act of worship. And we, when we do, are generous, we support the work of God. So much so that when they did this, they were told to stop because they were being so generous. They had more than they needed. They told them to quit giving. Amen. Praise God. Hey, I'm going to claim that one by faith in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen, I, I'm going to tell you, if you're new to the church, we don't talk a whole lot about money around here. We don't do that. We just don't do that. But, but we, ought to, we ought to take these things serious. Let the Lord deal with our hearts on what we ought to do. Amen. And so supporting God's work, there's all kinds of scriptures that talk about how they supported the work of God. Uh, in the book of Acts and other places to get the word of God out. And that's really what happens when we give to the ministry is to help further the gospel and the kingdom. It's really what it ought to be about. Hallelujah. Uh, we see this as a demonstration in worship. I talked about that, the contribution to the tabernacle. Uh, Jesus was anointed. Watch this, man. This is so good to be generous in, in, our, in our hearts and our minds towards the Father is an example to others because Jesus, before he was to go to be crucified, he's at Simon the leper's house, and he's there, and he's reclining at the table, and Mary, the mother of La mother, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, and Martha comes in, and she has this box of expensive perfume. It was, it was worth a year's wages, and she comes in with that box of expensive perfume, and she cracks this, this container open, and she just lavishes this Wastes it all on Jesus in an act of worship. And the Bible says the fragrance fills the room, and Jesus is honored. And then the religious in the room say, why did she waste all of that? That could have been sold and given to the poor. Now, there's two things here that you can see from that text. And I didn't even mean to bring this up, but I'm going to bring it up. One is the devil is the stirrer. Be careful, saint of God, that you don't allow the devil to influence your thinking and your actions. Christians can be influenced by Satan easily. When churches are split, it's because the enemy got in there and influenced people and divided people. That's why we've got to be surrendered and submitted to the Lord in everything that we say and do. Amen? 
So Mary, who has a heart of love and worship for Jesus, comes and she wastes this expensive perfume on him because it doesn't only just get on his hair and his and his feet, but I'm sure much of it got wasted on the ground, amen, and it was just laying there, and to the world it seemed, seemed like waste, and Judas, who represents the devil in this story because he was full of the devil, he says this should have been sold, and if you read Matthew's account, it says the other disciples got in on the action. Yeah, why did she waste that? Yeah, we could have sold that, and that sounded religious, and that sounded good, right, because let me just say this to you. Oh, thank you, Holy Holy Ghost for this right now. If I'm not going to be generous to God first, I'm not going to truly be generous to others. If I'm not going to love God first, I'm truly not going to love my neighbor as myself. Amen. Generosity, love, it all starts and stems from my relationship with God. It's got to go back to him first, and then it can be distributed to others. Amen. Otherwise, if I do it in reverse, I'm because I'm a selfish man, and if I do it in reverse, I'm going to withhold. I can look the part on the outside, but deep down in my inside, I know I'm not going to give because I'm a little too, too stiff. And if I withhold from people, I'm also withholding from God. Amen. I'd, oh, man, thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. <laughs> God is good. God is good. And so we, can, our, we have a demonstration of generosity in worship. And don't withhold your worship for any reason. And worship is not just song and dance. Come on, somebody. Worship is lifestyle. Worship is not just giving in the offering box. That is worship. Some might not believe that it's worship. Giving of tithe and offering is worship. But it's not just that. Worship is not just song and dance and not just giving in the offering. Worship is treating others as you would desire to be treated. Worship is loving your neighbor as yourself. That's worship. Worship is looking at somebody's need and trying your best to meet that need within your means or however you can do it, or even maybe beyond your means, as the Lord leads you. I'm not saying by any means just because somebody has their hand out, you ought to give to that person because there's a lot of, there's a lot of foolishness that goes on in the world. And some people just need to take responsibility for themselves, get up and get a job. But I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about if there is a real need and the Lord reveals that real need to you, we ought to do something to make sure that we fulfill that need. And that's generosity and that's worship. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm, I'll be done in just a few minutes. Oh, we show worship. We we show uh, we demonstrate generosity in, in acts of mercy. And one of the greatest pictures of this is the Good Samaritan. Come here, Forrest. You help me out, all right, buddy? Okay, that's good, man. Yeah, fix your hair there. We don't want you to be on camera with messed up hair. Here. Come here, Larry. You can help me out too. Praise God. Okay, you're going to be the, the Pharisee, all right? You, what was it? It was a Pharisee. It was a priest. Is it a priest, a Pharisee? Okay, you're going to be the, the priest, all right? He's got the beard for it, I think. All right. How many? Okay. Who really wants to do the, who wants to play the good role here? Mark, you want to be the, come on, Brother Mark, you can be the, nah, you sat down, you're not the good Samaritan. Come here, Brother Chris, you look like a good Samaritan. But yeah, come here, Chris Thompson, Thomas, come here, you're the good Samaritan in this. All right. Brother Mark, you get to be the, the guy that got beat up, so you come on up here, all right? You guys move to that side. Uh, you, this wasn't in my sermon illustration. I'm just going with it as I go with it, all right? Lay down there, man. Moan and groan like you've just been beat to death. <laughs> yeah. All right, you're in the back. I don't remember which order they went in. Does anybody remember? Was it the priest first and then the... Was it, was it, it, it doesn't matter. I need you guys to do a little acting here to help. All right? Somebody find that passage for me real quick about, about the Good Samaritan because I think this is going to be good. All right? Somebody find that for me real quick. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> Sherry, do you want to be the robber? Where's Sherry? She can be the robber and the mugger that put him in this situation. His wife can. I'm just kidding. Did, did we find it? Luke 10, 25. Put it up there quick. I'm going to read. We're going to narrate. I'm going to narrate. I'm going to narrate 
I'm going to narrate this passage, and you guys act it out, all right? Okay? All right, do you got it? All right. He's doing a good job. I don't know if he'll win an Academy Award, but he's doing a good job. For church performance, he's doing a pretty good job. Okay, now when I'm reading, you got to be still. But when it comes to your part, then you can moan and groan, all right? All right. Behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said, You know what is written in the law and how to read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this. And you will live. But he designed to justify himself, said to Jesus, but who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was coming down. Here, so let's do this right. Stand up. All right. All right. Come on. Get over there. You're coming down. Just walk slowly. When you get right here, you're going to get jumped. All right? I don't know. All right, I need some guys to jump him, too. I need some thugs. Come on, come on. Come on, Brother Denny. Come on, Brother Donzel. You, you guys are the thugs. In the, you're the robbers, all right? Praise God. And hey, let me tell you something. You'll never forget this sermon, that's for sure. You might not forget any. You might forget everything I said so far, but you will not forget this sermon. Uh, uh, you drop him, all right? All right. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, you guys get ready. You're laying in wait. You back up there, Mark. Now, I'll say, now, uh, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, walked slow, and he fell among robbers. <laughs> Come on, you got. <laughs> All right. Who stripped him and beat him? We're going to leave the strip part alone. All right. Stripped him and. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. They take him with you. That's good. That was really good. The way to act in the moment. They stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. All right, All right. he's half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road, walk slow, doing your thing, and he saw him. He passed by on the other side. Like, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and he saw him, he passed by on the other side. <laughs> now, do you see this right here? What's significant about that? The Levi and the priest were both religious. They both knew the law. It was a, it was a, it was a, um, a scribe or whoever it was that questioned Jesus. The beginning said, what is the, what is the great commandment? How do I inherit eternal life? You know the law. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus never did anything unintentionally. I believe Lazarus, the poor man, the beggar, and the rich man were real people. I think Jesus was talking about a real story. I think this was a real story that took place. It's a, some say it's a parable. I'm sure this happened. These were people that should have known better. We can come to church and shout praises to Jesus all day long, dance, holler, shout, put tithe in the offering. But, man, if we don't have genuine love for one another, do we really love God? All right, you ready? All right. Now, listen, I, I also picked you to you because you look like you could probably pick him up and carry him. So I don't know if we want to try that. But, you... but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Remember, generosity is compassion. And he went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. You want some real oil to pour on him? <laughs> and he set him on his animal and brought him to the inn to take care of him. Who wants to be the animal? No, just kidding. <laughs> All right, you can go ahead and take him to, Amen. And the next day, he took out two denarii, and he gave 
them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay it. When I come back, which of these three do you think, Jesus said, proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And he, and he said, the one, I see, and, uh, he, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and you do likewise. This is a true picture of generosity, love, and compassion towards people. This is what we want to model as a people. God forbid that we come to a day when we become isolated and we only care about our four and no more. Lord, put in our heart a compassionate heart towards those that are in need. The greatest need that anybody ever needs is the need of salvation because this life is fading away. You might not have money in your pocket, but that's just a temporal thing. But your eternal security is what's important. Where you're going to spend eternity. And we ought to be a generous people with distributing the gospel above everything else. God, help us to be that as a church. Help us to distribute, to, to exemplify, God, what it means to be generous with the gospel. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Daryl, come on back, buddy. Praise God. Praise God. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. I'm going to close. I got a lot more that I could say and I could preach. But I'm going to close with this, all right? And let's just take the Word of God seriously. Let's just take the Word of God seriously. Let's lean to the Word of God. We need to be generous not just with our material things and not just with our, not even in our spiritual, uh, uh, in our worship, because it's all worship, right? Not just what we do in here in the house of God. We need to be generous in showing mercy and forgiveness. Jesus says this in Luke chapter uh, 6, verse 38. I want to read it, but then I'm going to give you the context to it. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure in which you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, in that context, that, that, I believe that principle applies in every area of our life. Because the Bible says... That if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. So that's a spiritual law and principle. This context is in the context of judging others and holding on forgiveness. He starts off by talking about love. He preferences everything with love because love is the motivating factor. And he says, if you're going to give, you need to know that God's going to give it back to you in good measure. And what's he talking about? You can read it for yourself. He's talking about forgiveness and not judging others. We had a great conversation in the class yesterday about forgiveness and how forgiveness can help foster unity. And unforgiveness can bring discord and disunity. We've got to be a people that are generous and quick to forgive. Because we were forgiven much. Oh, man, come on. Now, that'll preach right there. We were forgiven much. Huh. I don't know if I should tell this illustration or not. I'm, <laughs> pray, my wife said, pray about it. Well, some of these guys have already told their testimonies a couple weeks ago. I got to tell this. I got to. All right. I think it's going to make the greater point. All right. So we were having a, a, our, guy, our, our brothers and sisters from KOE and some of our leadership from Power and Praise got together just to hang out and to know each other. So we were going around the room telling our stories about, you know, and, and just got into telling our backstories. Let's go across the room and I find out Donzel was a former drug dealer. I found out Brother Mark was a former drug dealer. I found out Brother Shelby was a former drug dealer. Ricky Reitz isn't here today because he's on vacation with his wife, but if you're listening, you were a former drug dealer by your own admission. We're going on I thought everybody in the room was a former drug dealer. Getting a membership class yesterday, Tony was a former, former drug dealer. Comes to Brother Courtney. Raise your hand, Courtney. First thing Courtney says, hi, my name's Courtney, and I never dealt drugs. I said, praise God. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> I was starting to feel bad. I was starting to think, man, I wish I sold drugs. <laughs> I feel like I'm being left out here. And then Courtney, he redeemed my moment there. I told him, hey, man, we got us non-drug dealers got to stick together. 
<laughs> Why do I say that? That's funny, right? It's hilarious. Look at what God can do when He can redeem a life. Amen. And let me tell you something. I might not have sold drugs, but I was just as damned to hell as the man who sold the drugs, as the woman who ran the street, as the man who beat it, whatever. I was just as lost as them, but praise be to God, he was generous in his mercy and his grace. Hallelujah. 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 Thanks be to God who overcomes that his mercy triumphs over judgment. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. As you do, God, I want to do. God, as you do, I want to do, God. Lord, as you are generous, I want to be generous. God, you are authentic. I want to be like you. God, Lord, you, you came in humility, God, and humbled yourself. I want to live like that, God. God, you honored your disciples. You honored your people, God. You honored it, the laven, the lost, God. Hallelujah. God, I want to be like that. I want to show people honor that they may see my good works and bring you glory and honor. Hallelujah, Father, Lord God, you are excellent in all that you do. And the least I can do is do all that I can do to bring you honor and glory. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We might be living some of these values out now, but we want to live them more. That's why we're preaching and teaching on them. We want to become more like Jesus, Brother Tony. Brother Joe, I want to be more like Jesus. I want to look more like Jesus tomorrow than I do right now. I want to sound more like Jesus tomorrow than I do right now. I want to act more like Jesus tomorrow than I do right now. And I want to live this out. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. But thanks be to God that I don't have to do it on my own. Why? Because God partners with me. In it. Because when I yield myself to Him, He empowers me. Not by might, nor by power, but by His Spirit. He empowers me by the Spirit to live out these values, to cultivate these fruits in my life. Hallelujah. Woo! You got something, brother? Let's just worship the Lord for a moment, and then we'll just see what He wants to do beyond that. Yes, we bless Your name. Hallelujah. Be generous this morning in your thanksgiving to God. Pour out your heart in thanksgiving to Him because He deserves it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We don't want to. We don't want to belabor anything. If you are in need of prayer this morning, we want to pray with you. You can make your way down if you want us to pray with you, or if afterwards you want us to pray with you and you want us to talk to somebody in private, we can do that. Be generous with your gratitude to God today. Even in your storm and your circumstance and your trouble and your moment of weariness, do not lack gratitude towards God. Because He deserves it. yielded to Christ today, make Christ the Lord of your life. Simply call on Him. Ask Him. Say, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, and come into my heart. Forgive me. Change my mind. Change my heart. And let the Lord meet you right where you're at.